Today on Locked On Red Wings, we're going to do player predictions for Adam Ernie, Michael Rasmussen, Joe Valeno, as well as give you a quick little update on Red Wings prospects at World Juniors. <laughs> Locked On Red Wings, your daily podcast on the Detroit Red Wings. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back to the Locked On Red Wings podcast. We are your hosts, Brian Fisher and Scotty Bentley. I am a podcast producer for WWJ News Radio 950. Well, Scotty is host of Locked On Tigers as well as a freelance journalist for the Detroit News. And uh, today we're going to just continue doing our player predictions. We're getting near the end of these. We only got a few more players left as well as we do got to do Alex Nadalkovich yet, but we're going to we're going to hold off until uh, later in the week to do that. Today we're going to be doing Michael Rasmussen, Joe Valeno, and Adam Ernie. But before we get to that, I'll do a little bit of a World Junior update. And just let you know that uh, the Red Wings prospects on Team USA are absolutely crushing it. Uh, Carter Mazur, since our last update, has scored four goals and has one assist, uh, two goals a game, one against, I think, Switzerland and one against Austria, I guess. Two against Switzerland and two against Austria. And the thing that really stuck out to me about Carter Mazur so far this tournament, Scotty, is he puts himself in the right place at the right time. His positioning is phenomenal, and he's not afraid to crash the net. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we talked about it a little bit on our last World Juniors update, but he uh, he's he's got that dog in him, you know. <laughs> it's that it's it's the gritty it's the gritty style of play, kind of like that uh, like the Bertuzzi style of getting goals. You know what I mean? Like just crash the net, uh, be be a menace, uh, re- really wreak havoc right in front of the net, and and good things will happen. And that's certainly what he's doing so far. Yeah, I mean, the one goal he had, he was playing bumper on the power play, and he did a great job of attracting pressure so the po- pass across the follow, follow, uh, opposite wing could go through. And then when the defender committed to the that winger, the pass came right to him in the middle, and he buried it. There were another goal where he just crashed the net. Pass came from behind the net out. He scored. I mean, he just is very – his positioning is very solid, and that's not a very – you know, talked about thing. People talk about like Kent Johnson's lacrosse goal, which was beautiful, by the way. But they're talking about all these pretty Weird. goals. But what Carter Mazur is doing is directly leading to the success of Team USA by just being in the right place when his teammates need him. And he's also setting himself up for the success as well. I mean, on a lot of these instances, he's making the initial pass to his teammate getting in position to bury the puck. And now granted it was against Switzerland and against Austria who aren't necessarily known as international powerhouses at, you know, the world junior or Olympic level, but they're not necessarily slouches either. You can't underestimate them. So there's a lot to be said about Mazur just doing the, you know, easy things. And that's not the right word, but the simple things, right? Because you have to build that base. Yeah, it's the fundamentals. You have to be able to do those things right before you can see it at the NHL level, and he is doing those things right. So I've I've really been impressed with what I've seen out of Carter Mazur so far at World Juniors. For sure, yeah. The the uh, the ability, like you said, to to kind of be like makeshift quarterback is also like really impressive, and just that whole style of play that that he has is. A really fun to watch um, when, when executed well, but B, he, he, like you said, he just looks really good. So yeah, I agree. Yeah, and uh, Red Savage as well got another goal since we talked last. When we talked last, he, yeah, uh, he had the one where he just fell to the ground and buried the puck when it was in the goalie's pads. But this last one, he found an opening, got behind the defender, got on a breakaway, top shelf. Actually, the go- ref called it a no goal at first because it went yeah. in and out, hitting the back bar. They had to review it. But it was a nice shot out of Red Savage playing fourth line center for Team USA, but still managing to produce at a decent uh, level. You know, he's looked good as well. But outside of him and Mazer, it was really Donovan Sobrango and Simon Edvinson who have really done anything of note since we spoke last. Edvinson had a nice slap shot goal. Yeah, it was a powerful slap shot. Golly. But he kept it low. That's the biggest thing is he yeah. kept it low. You know how hard it is to control slap shots? And it was a hard slap shot from the point, probably closer to the top of the circle, that he was able to keep just about yeah. six inches off the ground. It was a laser to the back of the net. And that's that's an important thing to have as a, as a defenseman especially. Yeah. <laughs> that, was, that, that, was, that was a very fun goal. I, I probably watched that video 
like that eight second clip of just the goal, like at least 50 times. Like I, mean, I, was, I was mesmerized when you're that tall and you have that much yeah. strength as Steve Eisman called me thick. Uh, you have an absolute <laughs> cannon and to get that on net and keep it as low as it was, is, is a very important asset to have as a defenseman. So I'm excited man. to excited to see that at the NHL level, hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, but as far as Red Wings prospects update goes, I mean, besides Donovan Sobrango's primary assist, that's about it. Sebastian Kosa hasn't played since that first game against Latvia, mm-hmm. I think it was. And yeah, then Wallander and Niederbach haven't done anything of note. So, you know, we'll transition right now into Adam Ernie and what his ceiling, his best case and worst case scenarios are for the Detroit Red Wings. Uh, this past season with the Red Wings, he played 79 of 82 games. He had just six goals and 13 assists for 19 points. Um, Not quite the follow-up season people were hoping for out of of him after he put up 20 points, you know, one point more, but he had 11 goals, almost double the amount of goals the season prior. Um, And he went on that eight-game point stretch. But in reality, I think this is probably what you have to expect out of him. I mean, his career high, he tied his career high twice with 20 points in his his six-year NHL career. And uh, he was just one shy of it again. But you know, he is what he is. He's not necessarily bad, but he's not necessarily good. So when it comes to talking about his best case and worst case scenario, Scotty, you know, I, I think they're very close. I don't think his best and worst case scenarios are very far apart whatsoever. I think he, Adam Ernie is what Adam Ernie is at this point. Yeah, I, I think this is a, a pretty quick one. And, and the other two, I think, have, have really interesting conversations that we're going to do today. But I think this one's pretty quick, just because like you said, Adam Ernie is what he is. And uh, you know, best case scenario, I guess, is maybe he hits 10 goals again, you know, as a fourth liner, that's pretty solid production and pretty solid depth, you know, being a more of a veteran leader type of thing. I, I guess that that's best case scenario. And worst case is he's getting healthy by like the trade deadline like that. You know what I mean? Like that's, I, I, I guess that's pretty much it. And, and I don't expect him to play 80 even with full health just because, uh, of kind he's of getting the, passed on the, the depth chart. Yeah, I mean, like, I, 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 we just have more depth than we've had in like half a decade, and and that's that's a great thing. Um, but it, it means that those fourth line, some of those fourth line guys are going to be kind of in and out of of the lineup at times, and so, um, yeah, I, I mean, I expect him to get healthy a couple of times, but uh, for the most part, I, I expect him to be one of the more probably frequent staples down there on the fourth line, maybe more so than, uh, th- than anybody else. Um, so yeah, like best case, again, the best case, maybe he breaks 10 goals again. Um, and, and worst case is he's getting healthy to a lot more than just, you know, once in a blue moon. Yeah. So he's just a fourth line winger. That's really what he is. Yep. He provides very little offense. He's decent defensively. And I just, his best case scenario is he's a fourth line. Like you said, he's a fourth line staple. He's there. He eats up minutes. Worst case scenario is he's a healthy scratch because he gets passed up on the depth chart by younger guys who are ready to make it at the NHL level. There's unfortunately not a lot to break down with Adam Ernie. I think, you know, him hitting that 10 goal mark because two seasons ago when he t- tied his career high in points, he set a career high in goals at 11 goals. I mean, I guess best case scenario is he gets back there again, but I'm not expecting that out of a guy who's going to be playing at best third line minutes, but I don't see that happening with the added depth. So, I mean, this is this is what I was talking about. There's not a lot of disparity between yeah. his best and worst case scenario just because he is Adam Ernie. This is what he is. And this is not this is not us taking a shot at Adam Ernie at all. This is just the player he is at the NHL level. He's a fourth line, bottom six forward at wing. And you know, he's not bad. He eats up minutes, he's but he's not necessarily he's a good locker room guy, but he's not necessarily a game changer either. So yeah, not a lot to break down with Adam Ernie. So best case scenario is he just has another season like he did this last last year, where it's about nineteen to twenty points, and he is, uh, you know, a guy. <laughs> yeah, be, a guy. Be, being a good leader. Yeah, yeah. So when we come back, we'll talk about Michael Rasmussen. Yeah, let's do Michael Rasmussen next. Do yeah. this on the fly. But first, I got to talk to you guys today about Built Bars. If you haven't tried Built Bar Puffs yet, you are depriving yourself of one of life's greatest joys. And guess what? There's a new flavor. Delicious, indulgent cookie dough. Covered in chocolate. That's right. Built has done it again. Let me introduce you to your new favorite. Cookie dough chunk puffs have a light and chewy texture. Real cookie dough chunks. And of course, 
They're covered in 100% real chocolate. All of the joys of eating cookie dough without the hassle and making it of making it. Plus, it's healthy for you. Cookie dough chunk puffs are only 160 calories, and they are they have a whopping 15 grams of protein in them. Run to Built.com to snag a box for you and the family. It'll be perfect treat. Or you can find a really good hiding place and just hoard them for yourself. Like all Built Bars, the new Cookie Dough Chunk Puffs is covered in 100% real chocolate. That means they are healthy and tasty. Chocolate-covered cookie dough with a light, fluffy texture. So good. You are going to love new Cookie Dough Chunk Puffs. Whether you need a snack for your workout, a late-night treat, or need to grab a quick bite, Built is the perfect protein bar. And they taste better than a candy bar. Ditch the calories, fat, and sugar. Grab yourself a Built Bar. Go to Built.com. Use promo code LOCKED15. And get 15% off your order. Go, use promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built.com. Segment 2, Lockdown Red Wings Podcast, Monday edition. Scotty and I are going to move on to Michael Rasmussen. And I think Michael Rasmussen leaves... He's a bit more of an interesting conversation because the conversation really stems with him is whether or not his future is at center or at wing with the Detroit Red Wings. Um, this past season with the Red Wings, he played 80 of the 82 possible games. He had 15 goals and a total of 27 points. And this is personally, I really want Adam, er or not Adam Ernie, sorry, Michael Rasmussen to be a center. I think that's where we'd get the most value out of him, especially given his size. And he did set a career high in points this last season by nearly 10 points. His career high previous to that was his rookie season of 18. He was at 27 this past year. So he has shown growth in his third full season as a Detroit Red Wing, but at times he looked to struggle in that center role, which is why he found himself playing wing in a lot of instances. Now down the stretch, as injuries began to mount, he fell back into that center role and he honestly finished the season pretty strong. Um, in my opinion, which is why I'm not ready to give up on him. And he did win just by literally a tenth of a percentile, but he did win over 50% of his uh, face-offs that he took at 50.1%. So there is something to be said about Michael Rasmussen's value at center still, but I know that's going to be the crux of the argument is whether or not that's his value because we have a lot of centers on this roster already and people want Joe Valeno to work out at center still. So I guess really when we're talking about the best and worst case scenario, Scotty, I guess we have to really consider what position he's going to be playing too uh, when we talk about it. Well, I, I, I think that that is that those are different answers depending on your best and worst case scenario of him. I, I think, I mean, I do like, we, we also have to remember this dude was a top 10 pick, right? Like this dude was taken ninth overall and, and he's only 23 years old still, but you know, he was taken ninth overall in 2017. Like this is, uh, this is a guy that I, I think as a fan base, we've kind of just accepted what, what we think he is. And, and he's probably not going to ever live up to the top 10 overall pick hype that, that he had, but, you know, least we forget, right? Like, the, you know, again, 10th over or top 10 pick. Um, I, I think that with him, if we're talking about a best case scenario, you're probably talking about him taking big strides forward at center and, and him being a, a solidified center that, that you can kind of pencil in going forward. Uh, he had 27 points last year. Maybe he playing majority center breaks into that like low mid thirties point total. Um, I, I think that that's probably, and, and you know, with his size, maybe he's getting some, uh, some, some special teams minutes. Like I, I, I think that that's probably best case scenario is him really solidifying himself as a solid bottom six center. Uh, and, and worst case scenario is he struggles, goes back to what he was, uh, well, I, I mean, not that he had a phenomenal, phenomenal season this past season either, I guess, but he just reverts back to kind of what we all have been expecting of him. And he slots in more to winger and probably gets healthy to every once in a while. So what's funny is you brought up him being a top 10 pick and he was selected ninth overall in 2017 by Ken Holland. And I remember when the Red Wings drafted him, the consensus was, really you're taking Michael Rasmussen top 10 and not that we haven't had that kind of thing before. Like when Moritz Sider was drafted two years later, it's like, Oh, you're taking Moritz Sider top 10, but Michael Rasmussen, when he was drafted, I mean, he, his skill set is not that of necessarily a top 10 talent. I remember a lot of head scratching going around when he was taken 
because of the fact that he is more of a um, not not a skill player, but more of a physical and front net front presence player. And a lot of people were um, confused by that. And so when we talked about Zadina just the other day, there was uh, several comments like, oh, why do you give Michael Rasmussen a pass and not but you give Zadina all this pressure? It just comes down to play style. They're not the same play style of play player. When Michael Rasmussen was drafted, people were saying he was probably going to top out as a bottom six forward, and that's where he is. Michael Ra- or Zadina, on the other hand, is a 40-goal scorer, or is what people thought he was going to be. So that's why we're, I'm, and I am hard on Michael Rasmussen, but I'm just more realistic about what the expectations are for a guy of his skill set. And I think bottom six center is where he could thrive despite being a ninth overall pick. And I, I think that what you said holds a lot of truth, Scotty. And he is not a goal scorer. He can be a pretty powerful net front presence with his size if he uses it. In the corners, he can be very intimidating to play against if he uses it. But that's been one of his issues is him using his massive size. He's not a small player. Everyone knows that. You see him on the ice. You know that he's massive. And he's used a lot. In a lot of cases, he's used in face-offs to win the face-off and get off the ice. He had 100 minutes of sh- uh, shorthanded experience. He played a lot uh, this past season. He played a lot in PK1, and I think that he can do well there because he is more of a defensive minded forward as well. So I think that Michael Rasmussen, while he played up and down the lineup due to injuries a lot this past year, especially down the stretch, he is a bottom six forward. And I think that's his best case scenario is he really becomes, if, if he can overtake, and this is a little bit of my bias, because I want him to be a center. I don't want him to be a wing just because of his size. I think that's important. Um, but if he can overtake Pew Suter as third line center, I think that would be best case scenario to have a man that big and be able to use him defensively, but also be a net front presence for the Detroit Red Wings. I think that'd be an ideal best case scenario for a guy of his skill set. And that's not a bad thing. A lot of people want more out of Michael Rasmussen because he's a ninth overall pick, but you just look at what he's capable of. He's never going to be a 30 goal scorer. That's not how he plays. So I'm sorry. Taking him at ninth overall was probably a stretch, but that doesn't mean you can't still get good value out of him. So I think best case scenario, again, third line center eating up important minutes on the penalty kill and just being a net front net front nuisance while shoring up things in the defensive zone. I think that's where Michael Rasmussen could thrive. Worst case scenario, at fourth line winger, healthy scratch. I mean, that's if he has an abysmal year. Even last year when we're talking about he didn't have – the best year. He still set a career high in points. His production did take it, still take a step forward. So I do see a future of him being an everyday NHL player, but I think worst case scenario is he's just moved to wing, not center. Yeah. And, and I, I share that sentiment. Like I said, I, I think that it's what position he plays is very deeply, you know, rooted in what his best and worst case scenario is. And I, and I wholeheartedly agree with you. I think best case scenario is we, find a guy that that we think can be a staple in the bottom six at, at the center position and worst case is you have to move him to wing because he's now productive and we have a, we have as it stands right now I, I mean more guys that we want to work out at center that have center positions right like we're going to talk yeah. about Joe Valeno and that's Maxton. a good problem to have absolutely yeah absolutely it is and so We'll we'll see. I mean, the fourth line is going to be really interesting. That whole bottom six is going to be really interesting to see who they decide to uh, to, to, to plug in there on a night to night basis. But I I agree with you. Um, I I think Rasmussen's best case scenario is he he figures out a, a really effective way to use his size, and he ends up being a, a pretty productive bottom six center. And and you know maybe even getting like second unit penalty kill stuff. You know if he can really figure it, like sure up the defense more and and continue using that size effectively. I mean, that's, that's a, that's a prototype for a penalty kill type player. Right. So there's a, th- there's a few different things that I, I think he can really end up being effective at, at the end of the day, that um, w- would lead to his best case scenario, but it's, it, you know, far from a slam dunk as it is with most of these guys. Yeah, absolutely. And then uh, we're going to take another quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about Joe Valeno and uh, if he's even really, an NHL caliber player. That's right. I'm going to ask the question when we come back. <laughs> segment three, Locked on Red Wings podcast. Would you not like that? Segment, right. Scott? Yeah, that's right. That's I'm right. Gonna I'm going to ask it. I'm going to ask the question. 
Uh, yeah, and I mean, that that's because Joe Valeno, he only played 66 games of the 82, but that's because, you know, he went up and down constantly. But when I was investigating Joe Valeno's more advanced metrics, I mean, we didn't necessarily have the best season. He was a rookie last year. You know, we have to keep that in mind. He was a rookie last year. But when he did play, it was not very good. Uh, and I remember we talked early in the season that Joe Valeno's ready for the NHL level. And so now here I am, eight months later, going, I don't even know if he's an NHL caliber player. And that's because his expected goals for percentage in 66 games played, Scotty, was 39%. When he was on the ice, the Red Wings only took 39% of the quality shot attempts in the game. Relative to his teammates, it's not any better. He was a negative 0.45, which is really, really bad. I don't really know how to exp- the quantify that. It's just almost a whole half shot worse relative to his teammates. And that doesn't sound bad, but when you compare that to someone like Adam Ernie, for instance, who is only a negative 0.03, that is not good at all whatsoever. And so Joe Valeno just really wasn't able to find his footing. It always felt when he was on the ice for the majority of the games, and he showed moments where he looked great. He did. He wasn't always bad all the time, or he didn't always underperform all the time. But in most cases, he looked like he was trying to play catch-up. Like he was on the ice, and he just couldn't get into position fast enough. He knew where he had to be, but he couldn't get there fast enough. So when talking about best and worst-case scenario for Joe Valeno, I think best-case scenario, Scotty, you're looking at a player who can really find his groove at the NHL level. You know, this is a season where he can potentially take a larger step forward in his development and just be at NHL caliber position-wise, speed-wise, production-wise. I'm not asking him to be, you know, a 20-goal scorer. I'm not doing that. But I just want him to look comfortable at the NHL level and really solidify himself you know, as a legitimate threat at center with the Red Wings. I'm not saying anywhere in the lineup. I'm just saying prove that he deserves to be a center over top of, you know, your Michael Rasmussen's, your Pew Suiters, your Robbie Fabry whenever he gets healthy. These guys who can play center, but he's going to have to beat out for a center role. That's what I want as a best case scenario is really prove that he deserves to be in that conversation. For sure, I... I think that I, I also think that if you're looking at the season as a whole, there was a few different, I want to say like ver- versions of like Joe Valeno. Like there was, there was when he first got called up and you were like, okay, he seems very overwhelmed and like almost not ready for this moment. And then, you know, he, he was up and down so much, like you said, but. I think after he, I want to say it was February. It might have been like all during the All Star break. break. It was, yep. Yeah. So when he got recalled after that, when he got called back up after that, I think that was the last time he got called up uh, on the season. I thought from then till the end of the year, uh, he showed some improvements. And I think by the end of the season, I, I mean, there was a point where he was playing like top six minutes. You know what I mean? Like we had so many injuries and everything. Like he was playing like 18, 20 minutes, uh, uh, you know, almost a night. So I think that he really stepped up. And, and with that, I thought that I saw some improvements and I thought that he, he took some strides. I think this season is – he's only 22. Like, there's still very much a potential for, for another big jump. And I think that that jump would be best-case scenario, right? Like he, like you said, he solidifies himself as the 4C for this team, right? Like, that, that I think would be best-case scenario is he really carves out a role. He does really well. And pretty early on in the year, you're like, okay, this dude is our fourth line center. I think that's probably best case scenario. While worst case is he still doesn't find his footing. Uh, I I think he's still waiver exempt. So like maybe a a lot of call ups and send down again, maybe kind of being that again, uh, like for a player we talk about. I I think that that's probably worst case, but 
I, I'm really interested to see, again, with him and Rasmussen sharing a line, like best and worst case scenarios aside, just like what I'm looking for in the season, I'm, I'm just fascinated in how they're going to use both of them and how they're going to play with each other and who's going to play what position and, and everything. There's a, there's a lot going on in that, that bottom six as a whole, but specifically, honestly, that, that fourth line on a night-to-night basis, that's going to be pretty fascinating to watch out for. No, and you, you you make a valid point that, you know, when you look at the scope of the season as a whole, it wasn't necessarily that good. But if I if you can make the argument that Michael Rasmussen looked better down the stretch, then you can absolutely make the same argument with Joe Valeno because you were right. I remember us having that conversation post-All-Star break when he, he, he tore it up at the AHL level, came back and seemed as if he had a new level of confidence. And once the injuries began to mount, there were games I remember him playing 1C for the Red Wings, and we were going, oh, man, mm-hmm. that's that's tough. But – you know, while he didn't, his production never really took a step forward. And how could it? I mean, he was playing one C at times. But while his time on the ice he hit a huge spike, he didn't necessarily flounder. Well, he never really impressed either. He never really seemed too so bad out of place that you're like covering your eyes, going, "I can't watch." You never really had that. In fact, there are a lot of games. I'm looking at the game by game log because you were talking about. It. I'm like, that's actually a good point. I'm I'm bringing it up. You know, from March, his time on the ice went from 13 minutes to leading the team per night with 17, 18 minutes on offense. From April 19th through April 29th, he had 17 minutes, 19 minutes, 18 minutes, 17 minutes, 17 minutes, 18 minutes. And in those games, you know, his faceoff percentage, he seemed overmatched in a couple of those games, but he won over 50% in others. This is a guy who is a rookie who wasn't necessarily in looking the best up until that point, forced to play above his, you know, his level at that time. And he didn't necessarily look any worse than he did down in the lineup. So there is potential there. I do. I, I do agree with that. So I guess in the end, when you're talking about best case, worst case scenarios for Joe Valeno is he continues to build how on how his season ended. And like you said, solidify that four C role. The worst case scenario is, you know, he looks like he did for the majority of the season out of place. And you realize that, you know, again, he's so young too. He's so young and sometimes players are late bloomers. But you realize that maybe this guy isn't a everyday NHL player. Maybe he's a call-up caliber player for the Detroit Red Wings. And I mean, hey, that's just the reality sometimes. Sometimes players don't look like bona fide NHL talents. But it's still too early to tell on Joe Valeno. And I like so with, young. with so young, like the conversation with Rasmussen, like the conversation with Zidina, with where this team is at, I am not willing to give up on any particular player yet. I'm willing to give every single one of these players at least one more season to prove what they got because this is the time to do it. This is a team that's building. So while I wasn't overly impressed with the bulk majority of Rasmussen's, Zadina's, or Valeno's seasons this last year, it's not the end of the line because this team still has a lot of room to grow together. So yeah, while I wasn't super impressed, I'm not giving up yet because there's still a lot of time for these guys to prove it because I think that this team is in that stage of the rebuild. Absolutely. Yeah, I completely agree with you. Uh, thanks for making Locked On Red Wings. You're the first listen every single day. Now make your second listen Locked On NHL. That's all I remember, so now i got to wait for it to uh, load. Locked On experts give you daily 30-minute podcasts on all things NHL all year long. Stay up to date on everything in the hockey world. Locked On NHL, your daily 30-minute NHL podcast. Scotty and I will be back on Wednesday as we uh, clean up the remaining players. Uh, I think we got to do Robbie Fabry still as he's battling another ACL injury. Yeah, our our from starting that. goalie. We got to do Alex Nadalkovich as well. We're kind of saving him to the end because we got to give you guys something interesting to listen to. And uh, we should probably do Stephen Comfort. I'm not really sure what the game plan is with this guy, but, you know, technically he signed I a think contract. We just have fun and do best and worst case for Simon Edmondson. And we could squeeze in a Simon Edmondson in there as well because based on the way he's playing at World Juniors, it's getting harder and harder to uh, argue that he doesn't make the Red Wings roster. So we'll talk about all that on Wednesday's episode. Thanks for listening. Scotty, any final thoughts? We will. That is the correct thought. Same time, same place. It's your team every day. Every day.